This is the first video for chapter 9, and in this one we're just going to talk about how to find our hypotheses for a hypothesis test and how to decide which formulas to use for a test statistic. We're mostly going to do some examples here. But first of all, when we talk about a hypothesis in statistics, this is a claim or a statement about some kind of characteristic or property of a population. So when we do a hypothesis test, or in some places you'll see it called a test of significance, this is just a standard procedure that we go through to let us test a claim about this property of the population. Here's some examples of hypotheses that we can actually test. First of all, if the FAA claims that the mean weight of an airline passenger, including their carry-on baggage, is less than 195 pounds. If we had some data from a sample, we could test that claim. Another one is if a newspaper headline makes the claim that most workers get their jobs through networking. Again, if we had some sample data from a survey, for example, we could test that claim. And in medicine, a hypothesis that we could test would be if medical researchers claim that when people with colds are treated with echinacea, the treatment has no effect. Well, hypothesis tests are difficult because they have so many different components. So here are some of the components they have, and these are things that you need to understand how to do. First of all, you need to be able to identify the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis from a claim. And you need to know how to express both of these in symbolic form, in other words, in mathematical language. Then you need to know how to calculate the test statistic, and part of that involves picking the right test statistic formula, which is one of the things we're going to go through in this video. Then in a later video, we'll talk about how to find the critical value, and then how to identify the p-value, and how to state your conclusions. First of all, when we talk about our null hypothesis, we use h and a zero subscript for this. This is a statement that the value of the population parameter we're interested in is equal to some specific value. And this is going to be a little bit different than what you see in your textbook, but this is actually the easier way to do this. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. In this course, we're going to assume that our null hypothesis always just has an equal sign. And when we do a hypothesis test, we're going to test the null hypothesis directly. And our conclusions in the end will be either to reject the null hypothesis or that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Then our other hypothesis is called our our alternative hypothesis. And in this textbook, they use H with a subscript capital A. In other places, you might see this as H sub 1. So this is something different than our null hypothesis. This is just a statement. It looks a lot like our null hypothesis, but it's saying that the population parameter has a different value than what, it, what we're showing in the null hypothesis. So again, what we're going to do in this course, just to make things a little bit easier, is that our alternative hypothesis is either going to have a not equal, or a less than, or a greater than. So we're going to look at some different claims and try to find the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis from each one. And here's some steps that we can go through. So when we look at our claim, we have to figure out exactly what claim it is that we're testing. And then we have to put that in symbolic form. So we have to write it as an inequality of some kind. Then we look at the form we came up for the claim, and we look at the opposite of that. So what if that original claim was false, what would be the true statement? And we look at the two expressions we came up with. We're going to have the alternative hypothesis be the one that doesn't have an equal sign in it. So it's either going to have a less than, or a greater than, or a not equal to. And then we're going to let our null hypothesis be an expression that has the same value, but it's just going to have an equal sign. This is a little hard to explain, so we're going to do an example. So if we look at the claim that the mean weight of airline passengers is less than 195 pounds, we're going to try and identify the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis from that. What is our claim in symbolic form? What are we talking about? What we're saying is that the mean weight is less than 195 pounds. Our mean is going to be mu, so that's our symbol for that. So we come out with the statement mu is less than 195 pounds. Then our next step was to think about what the opposite of that would be. So if that's false, then the opposite of that would be that mu is greater than or equal to 195 pounds. Now we're going to compare these two statements and see which one doesn't have an equal sign with it. Well, the one without the equal sign is that mu is less than 195 pounds. So we're going to make this al our alternative hypothesis. And that means our null hypothesis will just be mu is equal to 195 pounds. We wanted to actually write this out if we were starting 
to write down our hypothesis test, it would look something like this. H0, which is our null hypothesis, and that would be that mu is equal to 195 pounds. And then our alternative hypothesis would be that mu is less than 195 pounds. So with this would be the very first step in our whole hypothesis test process. Okay, let's look at another example. In this one we have a newspaper headline that makes the claim that most workers get their jobs through networking. This one's a little bit tricky because it doesn't actually give you any numbers. If you look at the wording where it says most, that we can interpret as being more than 50%. It's like saying a majority. So when we think about most workers, that would be mean more than 50%. If we wanted to write this, we would write it as a proportion, and we'd write that P is greater than 0.5. If we have a proportion like this in percentage form, we're always going to want to convert it to a decimal form. So our next step will be to think about what the opposite would, of that would be. Actually, we can usually skip this second step because we're assuming that our null hypothesis is always going to be an equals. But if we wanted to do it, we'd say if P is greater than 0.5 is false, the opposite of that would be that p is less than or equal to 0.5. But again, if we wanted to skip this step, we could because we already have a statement here that doesn't have an equal sign in it. We can already say that that's going to be our alternative hypothesis. And from that, all we have to do is replace the greater than sign with an equal sign to get our null hypothesis. So again, if we were going to write this out to start our hypothesis test, we'd have our null hypothesis that p is equal to 0 0.5 and our alternative hypothesis that p is greater than 0 0.5. Another example, medical experts claim that echinacea treatment has no effect on the duration of cold symptoms, that the average duration is no different than the 14-day average duration that occurs without the echinacea treatment. The claim actually is that the average duration or the mean duration is 14 days just like it is without the echinacea treatment. So that would give us our mean, which is mu, is equal to 14. Now the opposite of this would be that mu is not equal to 14. So we've either got that mu is equal to 14 or that mu is not equal to 14. So again, out of those two, we want to pick the one that doesn't have the equal sign to be our alternative hypothesis. So the mu not equal to 14 will be our alternative hypothesis, and mu equal to 14 will be our null hypothesis. So here's our first step for our hypothesis test. We're going to write our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. The second thing we're going to talk about in this video is how to pick the right type of test. When you're doing a hypothesis test, there are several different options. You have to know what type of test you're doing and which formula to pick. When we talk about a test statistic, we're going to have some different test statistic formulas and the test statistic is what helps us decide what the conclusion of our test is. We get the value of our test statistic from our sample data. So here are our formulas. If we're dealing with a claim about a proportion, then we use this formula. And it's always a little tough to figure out where the different numbers go. In that formula where you see the P bar, that's going to be our sample proportion. So if we have our sample data, that's going to be the proportion of successes in that sample. And where we have the P0, that's the proportion that we used in our hypotheses. So the actual number that was in our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. And that one goes in here and here and here. And N, of course, is our sample size. Now, if we're testing something to do with a mean, we have a choice of two formulas, and here's where we have to figure out which one to use. One thing that will help you with this is understanding what the different symbols mean. Notice that the difference between these two is that this one has a sigma, and this one has an S. And remember, sigma is our population standard deviation. S stands for our sample standard deviation. So the basic idea here is that we'll use this first formula when we do have a value for the population standard deviation. That's not going to happen as often. We use the second formula when we don't have a value for the population standard deviation. 
so when we only have data from our sample. And again here, to know which numbers go where, remember that the x bar is the sample mean, so that comes from the sample data, and the mu zero right here is from our hypothesis. So again, that's the actual number that's in our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. Here's an example. Back to our claim about the mean weight of airline passengers. We already had our null hypothesis was mu equals 195 pounds, and our alternative hypothesis was that mu is less than 195 pounds. Now we're going to assume that we know a value for our population standard deviation, sigma, and that's 18, and that we have data from a sample of 120 passengers. We had a sample mean of 192 pounds and a sample standard deviation of 16 pounds. The first question is which one of those test statistic formulas do we use? The first clue is looking back at our two hypotheses. Notice that both of them have mu. In other words, we're looking at a hypothesis test that has to do with a mean. So if we look back at our test statistic formulas, the two that had to do with means were these two down here. So it's either going to be this one or this one. Now which one of those we pick depends on whether we know the population standard deviation or not. Again, if we know a value for sigma, then we will use this formula on the left. If we don't know a value for sigma, then we would use the formula on the right. In this case, since we do have a value for sigma of 18, that means we're going to use the formula with the z. So there's the formula. Now we have to figure out which numbers go where in our formula. So remember that x bar is the sample mean. So from our sample data, we know our sample mean was 192 pounds. The mu zero, remember, is the number that's used in our hypotheses. So if we look at our hypotheses up here, the number that we had in both of them was 195. So mu zero is going to be 195. Then our sigma is going to be 18 and n is our sample size. Since we sampled 120 passengers, then our n is going to be 120. So in our formula, we're going to have z equals 192 minus 195 divided by 18 over the square root of 120. Here's another example. This one goes back to the example about most workers getting their jobs through networking. Our hypotheses were either that p is equal to 0.5 or that p is greater than 0.5. And let's say that we have results from a survey of 81 workers and our results are that 45 of them said they got their jobs through network. Again, the first question is which of those test statistic formulas do we use? And again, the first thing to look at is what our hypotheses look like. These have to do with proportions, but when we look back at our test statistic formulas, there was only one of them that had anything to do with proportions. So we're going to use this one. Now again, the next question is which numbers go where? And remember that the p-bar comes from our sample data, and this will be the same as when you were doing confidence intervals. So this is going to be the number of successes in the sample over our sample size. In this example, that will be 45 over 81. Our p0 Again, we're getting from our hypotheses. That's the number that we used in our hypotheses, so that's 0 0.5. And n is our sample size, so that's 81. Our formula ends up looking like this. We have our 45 over 81 for our p-bar, and we can convert that to decimal form if we want to. Then we have the 0 0.5 for the p0, and under our radical on the bottom, we have 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 divided by 81. One more example. This one goes back to the problem that had to do with the echinacea treatment. We already have our hypotheses, and again, just looking at those, we know this had something to do with a mean. In this case, notice there's nothing in here that says anything about the population standard deviation. So we have to assume that we don't know anything about that. And that means that the formula we're going to use is the one on the right out of the two we can choose for a mean. And that one looked like this. The only difference was that this one had s instead of sigma. s is for our sample standard deviation. Our sample mean is 12.9. Our mu zero comes from our hypotheses, so that's going to be 14. 
our sample standard deviation, the S, is 2.6, and our sample size, N, is 200. So our formula looks like this. We have 12.9 minus 14 on the top, and on the bottom we have 2.6 divided by the square root of 200.